Okay, uh, thank you, John, for the introduction. Thanks for having me. It's been really interesting in the last couple of days to listen to all your talks and uh, have the opportunity to speak with most of you. Um, so I'm here to speak to you today about a project that I've been working on for a little while now, looking at future fuels, uh, specifically for the application of long-distance international shipping, and uh, with a particular focus on hydrogen and ammonia as potential future fuels. So to give you a bit of insight about what I'm going to be talking about today, uh, I'm going to go over bit of why I think this is important and have a look at some of the current fuels that are being used in shipping as well as looking at some of the advantages and disadvantages of both hydrogen and ammonia and then I'm going to speak to you a bit about some of the data analysis that I've conducted and then talk about some of the potential implications and results of what I've found. So a bit of background, um, international shipping currently accounts for over 2% of uh, all greenhouse gas emissions. I think if it would be a country, it would be equivalent to something like the sixth largest country uh, of any polluter. Um, in order, due to uh, environmental concerns, the International Maritime Organization have set a target of 50% uh, reduction of greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. And they've also set regulations on nitrogen oxides or, and sulfur oxides or NOx and SOx. And um, the UK government in particular have uh, set, set a, a target in their recent clean maritime plan of there being a, a zero emission shipping being commonplace by 2050. And that's the, that's the term I really want to focus on there is uh, zero emission shipping. So uh, when I started looking at this project, the aim was initially to review some of the literature um, that's out there at the moment concerning future shipping fuels. And then to find um, what we consider to be a typical example of a long distance vessel and to look at some of the data on that um, and then try and run simulations and look at uh, various uh, potential solutions, how we could, might meet the energy demand of this uh, vessel and then to try and identify some of the key uh, engineering challenges that might um, be a concern. So to give you an insight of the sort of scale that we're, we're looking at here, I've tried to um, put together this image that shows uh, some various different potential energy sources and then with each of those we have um, a choice of how to store this and then the next decision is how to turn this from the, poten the chemical potential energy into propulsion, uh, perhaps either using a steam turbine, a combustion engine or a fuel cell. So what's used at the moment? Well, um, as we've heard, uh, HFO is um, by far the most used ship. It uh, produces a uh, hell of a lot of uh, CO2 emissions. Um, it's also very high in sulfur uh, because it's produced largely as, uh, from the crude, um, crude oil refinery process. Um, in order to try and meet the recent regulations on SOX, um, a, lot of, um, a lot of operators have chosen to fit a scrubber, uh, which is a post-combustion uh, device that um, can remove some of these SOX from, the, from being polluted. However, I think it is worth pointing out here that um, even though they can reach these regulations, they actually increase the overall energy demand of the ship, therefore increasing CO2 emissions to reduce uh, sulfur oxide. Um, alternatives to this can be uh, marine diesel oil or uh, desulfurized uh, HFO, which might meet the regulations at the moment, but if we're serious about zero emission shippings or low emission shipping, then um, the days of HFO are probably numbered. Um, LNG, which by now I think it's safe to say you're reasonably familiar with, um, but just to uh, just to clarify some, just to go over some key points I wanted to make, um, it's uh, one of the reasons why LNG grew so much as a um, fuel is because there was a high demand for it to be shipped globally, partly because it was cheap, um, and therefore if we're moving large tankers of it around, then why don't we use it to power these ships? So therefore, when I'm looking at some of these future fuels, uh, one thing I wanted to look at was actually what are the future cargo predictions looking like? How much of this stuff are we going to be moving around? Because it might be a good indicator. Um, also, it has a higher carbon, uh, hydrogen to carbon ratio than oil, so there's much lower emissions uh, being released. However, there are still emissions. So if we come back to this term zero carbon uh, shipping, then LNG perhaps may not be a, um, a long-term option. Um, in order to store LNG, the most common way of doing this is as a li uh, store natural gases as a liquid, which can re reduce the volume requirements by about 600 times, but requires um, a um, requ requires a uh, temperature of around minus 160 degrees Celsius, um, 
With this, we get a certain level of boil off. Um, there's a couple of options with that. We can re-liquefy it, turn it back into a liquid, but, but obviously there's an energy cost involved with that, or we can try and use that boil off directly into the steam turbine, which seems to be the, the method of choice for LNG tankers at the moment. So future fuels, um, one of which has been talked about quite a lot at the minute is hydrogen. Some of the reasons for this is, well, first of all, there's no carbon content. So there's not going to be any CO2 emissions uh, at the point of use. Uh, for example, using a PEM fuel cell, the only byproduct would be water. Um, another advantage is it's particularly light, which can help the performance of a ship. And it has a high burning rate, meaning that, again, the, the um, if, uh, performance could actually exceed that of, uh, of the diesel engines that we use at the moment. There are, however, it's safe to say, a number of challenges. Uh, first of all, um, if we're talking about zero emission shipping, then really the supply should be um, zero emission as well. Most of hydrogen at the minute is made using the process called steam reforming, which uses primarily uses fossil fuels. However, there's been a lot of uh, advancements in the field of electrolysis in recent years, which operates um, as effectively as a reverse fuel cell and requires only electricity and water as a feedstock. Therefore, if the electricity is uh, provided from renewable sources, then it can then be considered uh, carbon neutral. Um, refueling time is important in shipping. Uh, we don't want to be sitting in a port for ages waiting for it to fill up. And there's plenty of evidence that the refueling time can be comparable to that of diesel. And another point I wanted to make on hydrogen supply is, as I mentioned with LNG, the um, if there's evidence that there's going to be lots of this stuff being moved around and it's more likely that it will prosper as a fuel. And I wanted to use, just look at the case study of Japan that estimates by 2030 there's going to be uh, 800,000 hydrogen cars on the road in Japan. And in order to meet this demand, they're going to have to import 5.5 to 11 billion pounds worth of uh, hydrogen every year. So it's definitely a strong case that uh, a lot of this stuff might be moved around. Um, next challenge, next big challenge really with hydrogen is how do we store it? Uh, there's a few options for this, but there's three of them I looked at in particular were storing it as a pressurized gas, uh, where we'd have pressures up to 700 bar, or keeping it as a liquid like we do with uh, natural gas. Uh, but the, one of the challenges with this, um, again, is, uh, well, one of the main challenges with this is the temperature required is much, much lower. Uh, so you're looking between 14 and 33 Kelvin. Um, and again, with um, similar to LNG, there'll be a certain level of boil off with that. So it's something we'd have to deal with. And the, the third option I wanted to look at as well, um, which is metal hydrides, which is the most um, effective way of storing hydrogen in terms of volume. This is where hydrogen is bonded uh, to metal, uh, as you can kind of see in this image demonstrated here. Uh, this can let's say this is fantastic for, in terms of volume, but then you also have the weight of the metal itself to consider. Um, the third option for one of the another thing I wanted to look at in terms of hydrogen is the choice between burning it or using it as a fuel cell. Um, the high flammability means that it's, uh, it's pretty easy to burn, perhaps too easy, but uh, we'll come on to that. Um, but the, there'd be a bit of a change, the, the hydrogen generators that we use in the minute would at least need some modification, uh, if not a complete uh, revamp. Um, a fuel cell is the um, is a process where you take advantage of the energy stored in the chemical bonds to create electricity, uh, which is the most effective work method of extracting energy from hydrogen, but then would require an electric drivetrain. So you're talking about uh, redesigning pretty much most of the ship at this point. Um, moving on to ammonia. So ammonia has uh, some similar advantages that it is entirely carbon free, so there'd be no CO2 emissions. However, it does have a nitrogen, high nitrogen content, so we have to, con so the release of nitrous oxides is a concern. Um, there is the potential to fit a post combustion device like a scrubber, as we did with HFO, but as I've discussed, this can actually increase the energy demand of, of the ship in total. Um, but one of the main drivers behind ammonia is, is pretty simple to store. It is uh, much easier than um, hydrogen. And there is an existing global supply chain, um, although it's mainly for the fertilizer market at the moment. So I touched on ammonia supply. So there is an existing global supply chain. 
Uh, this mainly uses the Haber-Bros process to um, produce the ammonia, which is very energy intensive um, and is, I think, currently accounts for around 1% of greenhouse gas emissions globally, which is, if we're going to increase the production of ammonia to fuel power fuels, then this is, um, would, it, it would really need a big overhaul um, to produce green ammonia. Um, so there's definitely work to be done there. And I think it's also worth pointing out that the ammonia production process, even green ammonia, still requires a hydrogen feedstock. So if either of these are going to be an option, then we still need to increase the um, hydrogen production. Um, so the, there is a globally, because there's a global supply chain, there is also globally existing safety protocols. However, these may need to be updated or altered if we're going to be using them for a different application or storing them in places where they might come in contact with humans, such as ports or ships. Um, again, the refueling process is relatively straightforward and comparable to that of, in terms of time, to oil. And I wanted to look as well at the projections of future cargo levels. Um, these are not as um, transparent as hydrogen. Uh, there's the potential we could be using the refrigeration market. But I think it's interesting to point out that, it, I, at least from my experience, I haven't seen many other industries talking about using ammonia as a fuel. I haven't seen ammonia cars. We haven't seen ammonia for heating. Um, so that could be a barrier, and its, it's uh, toxic nature, could, uh, corrosiveness could be, could be another potential barrier. Um, the storage, though, it's much easier to store. We can store it as a liquid at a uh, 10 bar of pressure or a, a much more achievable temperature. Um, again, I think as we heard earlier, the uh, fuel cells are the most efficient way to, uh, um, to extract the energy, particularly the solid oxide fuel cell. That's going to be fed directly with ammonia. And um, there's then the following option of uh, using ammonia as a hydrogen carrier, which some sources suggest can have roughly the same energy cost as, um, as the energy required to cool the uh, hydrogen when storing it as a liquid. And uh, another source suggested that the conversion rate of the cracking process could be up to 99% efficient. But then if we're looking at doing this on board, we've got to think about the extra space required for, the, uh, for this additional step in the chain. So a bit more on what I've done. So what I did is gathered some data on what we consider to be a typical LNG tanker. This tanker has um, performed uh, 108 different voyages over a period of uh, just over three years. So we think it's a fair representation of most long haul vessels. Um, as it's quite a long period of time, I've assumed that the effects of waves and weather on this, on the energy consumption at least, has effectively balanced itself out. Um, but it is worth noting that I've not considered the auxiliary power requirements at this stage. I've mainly just focused on the uh, energy required for propulsion. So from the, the data set that I received, hopefully you can see this, it's not too, too blurry. Um, but first of all, I looked at a reading from this data called uh, based on shaft power. So the shaft to uh, power the propellers. And from this, I can make an estimate of the total delivered energy of each of these 108 different voyages. I've tried to show them here in descending order. Um, it's interesting that there's a, actually these can range quite a lot from the lower ones to the, to the higher ones. Um, and the maximum delivered energy of any voyage was 9,270 megawatt hours, which is a figure that I base most of my figures on. However, it is worth pointing out that as it ranges quite a lot, then a value of 6,350 megawatt hours would have actually been sufficient to power 96% uh, of the voyages. I've also included up here as well the uh, total distances for each of these voyages and the total duration, time at sea. Um, and it, it, it's worth, again, there's quite a lot of variation there. And it's also worth pointing out that they don't directly correlate to the um, most energy consumption of any voyage. Um, so based on this figure that I found of the 9,270 megawatt hours, I was then decided to look at eight different scenarios of how we could meet this demand. So we have the current fuels of LNG and HFO, and then hydrogen with three different storage methods, ammonia or methanol, which I haven't spoken about yet, but uh, it's a further potential future fuel, although it does have a carbon content, so it's debatable whether we could consider that to be a zero emission ship. 
And also, if it would be interesting to include batteries, because we're hearing a lot about batteries nowadays, especially in electric vehicles and things like that. Um, from this, I was made an estimate of the efficiency of each of these processes, um, and then used the higher figure to estimate a required input of energy. Then, from this, I can make calculations on the required volume, mass, and price of each of these potential options. Now, I appreciate there's a lot of information on this table to take in, so I'm going to go through each of these points in a bit more detail. First of all, I wanted to look at the volume requirements for each of these options. And one thing that stands out here is batteries is, takes up way too much space. Um, the next highest is hydrogen stored as gas, and uh, the, the rest are all quite, uh, quite comparable. Um, to put this into context, I wanted to look at the, invest the tank in particular has a backup tank uh, for field of HFO that is, um, can provide propulsion. Now, this LNG tanker um, mainly uses the LNG itself to propel itself, but it also has this, this backup tank. And I thought, because this is not part of the cargo, it's purely for propulsion, then it'd be interesting to compare the size of this tank, as you see highlighted here in the green, to actually the size requirements of these different options. Um, so it, it it could power, if this was full, filled 88% of the way with HFO, then it could propel even the longest of journeys. Um, but it's interesting, obviously batteries looks far too big at this stage. Uh, ammonia looks quite achievable though. And I think actually hydrogen is often dismissed um, as having too low a volumetric density. But when we look at these figures, actually I don't think the particularly liquid hydrogen is that unfeasible. Uh, in terms of uh, having to increase that full fuel tank, and even pressurized gas is not inconceivable. So perhaps it shouldn't be dismissed on those grounds at this stage. Uh, the next thing I looked at was mass. Uh, again, batteries are way too heavy for this application. And the, the metal hydrides, because of the extra weight of the metal itself, um, they're a bit too heavy as well. But I think it's also worth pointing out that the next highest there is ammonia. Um, so this is something that... Um, <coughs> Perhaps people don't speak about as much about ammonia, but its, it's gravitational energy density is actually quite low compared to LNG or uh, particularly hydrogen. To put that into context, this could increase the uh, um, total weight of the vessel by um, nearly 3% compared to hydrogen or a couple of percent compared to LNG or even a percent and a half compared to HFO. So that's not uh, negligible. Um, in terms of the cost of the fuels, um, I've tried to make an estimate of how much this would cost. Um, as you can see, hydrogen, well, as you can see, first of all, batteries, are get, again, is quite expensive, but so is hydrogen um, at this stage. However, these calculations were based on if we went to the local gas station and filled up a hydrogen car. So obviously, we're going to get more economies of scale. Um, we also, it's worth noting that ammonia is perhaps getting to the point where it might be competitive with HFO. Um, but touching more on hydrogen, uh, as I say, the electrolysis process has, um, take, has advanced considerably in recent years. Um, so this has led to some projections that the cost of electrolysis uh, could be reduced to around um, 58 pence per kilogram, per kilogram to produce, ex excluding the electricity cost, and also the electricity, the amount of electricity required to produce each kilogram is projected to be reduced as well. Therefore, by 2025, um, the, my projections suggest that in order to power even the furthest of these journeys, then the cost would only cost uh, around to £260,000 plus the cost of electricity, which I've tried to represent in this graph uh, on the right-hand side there. Um, so this is my initial prediction of the hydrogen cost um, compared to the the current electricity price. Um, and then it's also worth, so you can see already it's starting to look more competitive. And then when you compare that to actually, if we were getting this electricity from, say, a solar farm in Australia, for example, it's likely the electricity we're going to be paying is considerably lower. So at uh, the lower ranges, this, it shows that uh, hydrogen potentially has the, um, uh, potentially um, could be one of the most economical options that we have available in the not-so-distant future. 
So to summarise, um, emissions from shipping have to be reduced um, if we're going to um, meet some of the targets required. If we're serious about zero emission shipping, then the days of oil and gas are probably numbered, uh, unless there's a big advancement in carbon capture and storage, um, but that, that's yet to be seen. Um, for this application of long distance shipping, batteries on their own seem to be impractical. However, that's not, uh, it's worth noting that perhaps they may have a role to play in shorter distance shipping or perhaps in a hybrid system to help meet peak demand with uh, perhaps in conjunction with a fuel cell. Um, hydrogen has a lot of promising char characteristics, but there are fundamental engineering challenges that need to be addressed um, before it becomes a reality. However, one point I do want to emphasize is that it shouldn't be dismissed as infeasible purely on the basis of its volumetric density from, from what I've seen so far. Um, ammonia has the advantage of being considerably easier to store, but the additional weight requirement from ammonia, as well as the concerns about um, other pollutants being released, particularly NOx, um, show that there's, there's still work to be done there. 